Order. The sitting is resumed and it's time for questions to the Minister of Justice and we will start with listed questions. And I call Mr Jim Allister. Question one. Mr Speaker, I understand that the Peruvian Ministry of Justice and Human Rights has yet to indicate that it has consented to Michaela McCollum's repatriation. Therefore, the terms of her transfer have yet to be agreed. Is it correct that the Peruvian authorities, as terms of the transfer, would have to agree the term, the length of prison sentence she would serve in Northern Ireland? And is the minister anticipating that she should at all serve less than she would have served in Peru? Well, Mr. Speaker, I can't go into the detail of that, but the expectation is that sentences would be worked out on the basis of our normal provisions from the time in which somebody is repatriated to Northern Ireland. And that is a matter of some detail which would have to be worked through if there is an agreement by the Peruvian authorities to repatriation. Uh, speaker, uh, can I ask the Minister, just in relation to the transfer of this um, individual to Northern Ireland, uh, if in fact the, she will be uh, eligible for the early release, and furthermore, does he intend authorising the expenditure of legal aid in this whole transaction? Well, Mr Speaker, I'm not sure in what circumstances the issue of legal aid would arise. Uh, there are set arrangements which apply as to how sentences are carried through, and the precise details which go through depend upon the nature of the sentence within Peru, as well as the nature of how matters would be considered on the basis of a sentence within Northern Ireland. Those issues will have to be worked out if there is consent on the part of the Peruvian authorities. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank the, the Minister. Uh, could the Minister provide us with any detail he might have of the costs associated with the transfer, repatriation and the need imprisonment to the public purse locally of Michaela McCollum. Gurma Ogut, thank you. Well, Mr Speaker, I can't apply details of the cost in relation to Michaela McCollum. I can outline the costs as they apply in the case of any prisoner who is repatriated. And indeed, I do notice that I've had quite a number of uh, uh, measures suggested by MPs and MLAs from a variety of different parties about the repatriation of prisoners in different circumstances. The reality is that the costs are met by the receiving jurisdiction under both the UK Convention and the bilateral agreements the, the UK has. The expectation for any prisoner being repatriated into Northern Ireland is that they pay the costs of their fare. Once they are a prisoner here, their costs are met by the prison service within the existing prison service budget. In the, in the event that uh, Ms McCollum's application for repatriation is successful, uh, can the Minister ensure that the emphasis of his department will be on rehabilitation and training in, in order that she can successfully integrate back into society again upon her release? Well, again, Mr Speaker, without discussing any individual, the emphasis of the prison service in general is on rehabilitation. One of the key reasons why prisoners uh, can be repatriated to their home jurisdiction is to aid in rehabilitation through maintaining family contacts. That is an established process, as I've said, under the European Convention and a number of bilateral agreements, and that is the basis on which we seek to work with all those who are in custody in Northern Ireland. Mr. So speaker, um, the Minister has been quite vague in his answers uh, in relation to this case. I'm just wondering, has an application or request been made for the repatriation of Ms. McCollum to Northern Ireland Prison? And if that application or request has been made, who has it been made by? Mr. Speaker, I haven't been the least bit vague. I have answered the questions that were put and the question related to the terms and conditions which have not been set because there is no agreement. But it's absolutely clear and it's a matter of public record that an application has been made by Michaela McCollum, which has been accepted within this jurisdiction, but has not yet been accepted in Peru. 
Commissioner Alec Easton. Question number two, Mr. Speaker. I have set out my plans to reduce expenditure in, on legal aid on a number of occasions. In my response to the member in November, I outlined some of the pressures facing the legal aid budget. I have already reduced fees paid to lawyers by over £22 million, with further significant reductions to be implemented shortly. However, the demand for legal aid continues to increase, and in reality, this cannot be addressed without reducing scope. I am currently consulting on a range of measures. I cannot, however, deliver these changes on my own. The reforms will be significant, and as I have already advised my executive colleagues, support across all areas of government will be required. I was disappointed that the reference to support for legal aid reform was removed from the budget paper issued last week. I have made and will continue to make strong representations at the executive for support, and I hope that all members of the House will also support my reforms. Could I thank the Minister for his answer? The um, Minister mentioned about reducing the scope he's going to look at. Would he be able to outline what uh, ways he's going to reduce uh, where people are able to apply? What, what areas is he actually looking at? Well, Mr Speaker, as I am intending to speak to the Justice Committee tomorrow on this issue, I don't really wish to go into the detail of the potential, but let me say that recognising that there will be a need to remove some items from scope of legal aid the emphasis will be on protecting those who are most vulnerable in ensuring, for example, that family cases continue to attract legal aid for the basic hearing, to ensure that where we look at changing matters, it's because we're better implementing uh, financial uh, controls over, for example, criminal defence work, where there have been allegations of some defendants who have very significant resources being supported by legal aid, and also ensuring that when things like money damages are being taken into account, where there is the potential for payment through an insurance scheme or something similar, those are the areas where we will look to re reduce scope. We will certainly do our best to ensure that we protect the vulnerable as far as is possible on the extremely difficult budget that we now have. I'm going to this down the era. Will the Minister ensure whatever plans he has uh, regarding legal aid that he will go through an equality impact assessment? I'm happy to confirm that to Mr Lynch as I confirmed to one of his colleagues at the Executive last week that certainly any changes will be subject to an equality impact assessment. Call Mr Fregel McKinney. Uh, Mr Speaker, um, uh, could the Minister confirm that uh, uh, as a result of dealing with backlog issues, uh, that in fact belies the reality that there has been substantial reductions and indeed a downward trend in terms of uh, legal aid cases up to around £20 million uh, um, uh, in criminal law. Well, the position is that over the years from 2010 11, expenditure in each case has been between £101 and £110 million. That's the estimate, obviously, for the current year. All, all of that takes into account the very significant reductions that I've already referred to in terms of over £20 million being taken from the criminal defence budget. The reality is that is an indication of rising demand that even though significant sums have been reduced, the cost continues at a very similar level. That is why we need to look at further very significant reforms. I call Mr Trevor Lunn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister how big the financial pressure is on the legal aid budget and therefore his entire departmental budget, and what will be the implications if the Executive and the Assembly don't support him when he brings forward further measures to tackle this issue? Mr. Speaker, in round terms, the pressure which was anticipated for this year, is, also the incoming year, is £36 million. With additional funding having been allocated uh, within the department's work between draft budget and now, the pressure remains in excess of £20 million. The reality is that that £36 million pressure on legal aid, not total cost of legal aid, exceeds the cost of running the core department. That is a measure of the scale of it. Given that the decision of the executive was to provide additional funding to the PSNI but ring fence to the PSNI. It actually gives very little room for ma manoeuvre amongst the 30% of department spending, which is not policing. 
and makes the pressure across the rest of the department unsustainable if we do not get very significant reductions in legal aid. That's why I trust that I will see both the executive and the House supporting those very necessary measures. Thank you. And I call Mr. Barry Megalduff. Mr. Speaker, I received the stock take report from the independent assessors on the 25th of September last. The Northern Ireland Prison Service accepted the nine recommendations within its responsibility and continues to work towards their implementation. Progress that has been made includes my appointment of an independent chair for the Prisoner Forum. The Prison Service has taken the first incremental step towards normalising the regime by allowing four prisoners onto each of the two landings. NIPS has also made changes in line with the recommendations to the approach to full body searching, which is now more acutely focused on intelligence and risk. These are clear signals that the prison service is prepared to normalise the regime offered to prisoners as and when it is appropriate to do so. However, that is only in an environment where the security of the establishment and the safety of staff, visitors and prisoners remains the priority. I made it clear when the stock take was published that addressing the recommendations was a responsibility shared by the prison service and the prisoners. If momentum for change is to be maintained, I would, and others with influence should, encourage the prisoners to fully engage with that process. Mr. Michael Duff, for a supplementary. Uh, May, but, uh, can I ask the Minister if he's satisfied that the recommendations are being addressed to ensure that everyone is treated with dignity and respect? And to be specific, uh, but not too specific, can I express concern that a prisoner from the Omi area has been in solitary confinement for over two years and I have spoken to his family? Uh, can the Minister undertake to investigate the background to this unhealthy situation and perhaps communicate directly with me on this matter? Well, Mr. Speaker, Mr. McElduff first asked about the issue of everybody adhering. Uh, sadly, it is the case that threats both on Row House and through social media continue against prison officers. So if we're talking about everybody adhering to the agreement, let's be clear that a number of prisoners and their support groups are not adhering to the agreement. On the specific of individuals, I believe there are a small number of individuals who remain in the care and supervision unit because they have not met the criteria for admission uh, to the separated uh, accommodation and who have been unwilling to integrate into the remainder of the prison. That is clearly an unfortunate situation, but if individuals do not meet the criteria, which are not set by me, there's criteria for the Secretary of State, then there's nothing else that the prison service can do to manage them safely. I call Mr. Alistair Ross. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In recent weeks, I've met with a number of prison officers who are becoming increasingly concerned about their own safety uh, and the arrangements that are placed in, in McGabry Prison. Can I ask the Justice Minister whether he's confident that the arrangements in place are adequate to avoid a major incident uh, in the coming weeks and that prison officers are not under any threat because of the arrangements that are in operation at McGabry? Well, Mr. Speaker, my committee chair asked a very serious question because there is absolutely no doubt that there are threats being made and there are concerns for the safety of prison officers both outside and inside the prison. That is something which should stop. Those who wanted the agreement to be reached in August 2010 should accept the agreement. They should live up to it. They should encourage their colleagues outside to accept it as well. And that includes an end to any threats against any member of the prison staff, whether on duty or off duty. The key issue for maintaining the safety of prison officers, as for all others in this society, outside the jail, rests with the police service, and I know the police service are very active in the work that they are doing to protect those most under threat. I call Mr. Pat Ramsey. The Minister's comments as, re as regards threats and made it clear in the Chamber. Could I ask the Minister, given how sensitive and how volatile the situation is in Row House, and given one of the key elements of the Stock Aid report was the, the process of and the involvement of an independent chair, is the Minister content and confident that the arrangements put in place would have the confidence of both the staff and the prisoners in this particular person? Well, Mr Speaker, it's not always easy to have confidence in how other people will perceive things. Certainly, I believe that the individual who was selected was somebody who had a background which showed a degree of independence, an understanding of the way that the prison operated, and the ability to do the task that was requested of him. 
but the issue of how confidence uh, is carried forward in the operation of the arrangements on both sides is clearly an issue which will depend to a considerable degree on goodwill on both sides as well. Thank you. And I call Mr. Alvin McGuinness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, question number four. Always happy to help out, Mr. Speaker. But with permission, I'll take questions four and seven together. The campaign referred to concerning the removal of childhood offences is being led by NIACRO. I met NIACRO with Bob Ashford and Simon Weston when they launched the campaign. Bob's and Simon's cases are compelling. But this is a complex issue that requires careful balancing of public protection with the need to ensure that young people are not stigmatised for the rest of their lives because of a single poor choice, leading to a record for minor offence at an early age. One aspect of this is disclosures by Access NI. I have already taken important steps towards achieving a more balanced approach. The filtering arrangements which the Assembly agreed last year have seen a significant number of old and minor offences removed from the standard and enhanced criminal record certificates issued to those who want to work or to volunteer within regulated activities. Shorter timescales for removal applied to those under 18 in recognition of their youth and the importance of their rehabilitation. As a further step, and one which goes beyond the position in England and Wales, I am preparing to bring forward a review mechanism for filtering as part of the Justice Bill. This means that a person will be able to ask for an independent review of their case, even after the application of filtering, if they believe that the disclosure of the information is disproportionate. This new process will include an automatic referral for cases with offences committed only under the age of 18. I'm happy to continue to engage with NIACRA and others on the issue to ensure that the right balance is struck. I call Mr McGuinness for supplementary. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. And I welcome the uh, general thrust of the Minister's answer, which certainly indicates uh, sympathy to the whole idea of removing uh, minor offences from criminal records of young people. Would the Minister uh, support the idea of a panel, a multidisciplinary panel, that could look at uh, more contentious cases? Uh, and would he be supportive of that uh, general concept? Mr. Speaker, I have to confess that I'm somewhat reticent about the idea of a multidisciplinary panel to carry out effectively the review process which we are looking at introducing. There are clear issues about the complexity, about the cost, about the ease of getting a speedy decision for those who seek to be referred to the panel. And I think if it can be done correctly by a single reviewer, there may be no need to look at the wider panel. The clear issue will be to recognize that there is significant progress being made, and I'm grateful for Mr. McGuinness acknowledging that, and to assure that we get a speedy way in which individuals can have their case reconsidered, which is not overly bureaucratic, but which ensures that we make the right decisions as far as possible. I call Ms. Sandra Overend. Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, for his responses so far. Does the Minister recognise that, that both the current and proposed filtering processes mean that young people cautioned or given a discretionary disposal for a spe specified offence will not benefit from filtering, contrary to, to the Youth Justice Review's assertion that div divisionary um, proposals should not attract a criminal record or be subject to employer disclosure? Well, I thank Mr. Overend for the question, which is you know, one of those points which needs to be considered in detail. The reality is they, they follow through from the issue of youth engagement clinics, which are designed to ensure that the process is significantly speeded up. And at those clinics, when the diversionary disposal is recorded, there is a clear explanation given to young people as to the potential effects on that. So I'm not sure that the concerns which have been raised by some members about the potential that that would be a disincentive have actually been proven to be the case in practice. But certainly it is one of those issues which we will be keeping under review. And I call Mr. Raymond McCartney. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for his answers. The album again has referred to the Protector campaign. And I, I think perhaps the easiest way to go forward, this is for perhaps the department to define what they consider a minor offence and then seek to legislate 
to, to ensure that they are not taken into account, indeed they're taken off the record. Would the Minister agree that's a sensible way to go forward? Well, Mr McCartney's idea certainly sounds simple in practice. It's probably easier to define what's not a minor offence than what is a minor offence. And there, you know, there are a number of issues which need to be taken um, because they will also relate to how, how many offences there were, how frequently they were. There are differences of, of gradation and degree even between what might be termed minor offences. So I'm not sure it's that easy to say this is a minor offence, it doesn't count. The important thing is to find, and I do believe the potential for review ensures that we can get those tested in an individual case perhaps rather easier than by trying to legislate to specify at which point we will always come across those cases which don't quite fit the system. I'm going to call Mr Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, thank you, Minister, so, so far for his, his answers. Could I ask the Minister, and they referred to there um, recently about the filtering regimes for minor offences, or so-called minor offences, and he talked about reviewing. Could he maybe expand it more, and, and how he's going to expand on that? Um, I, I have a feeling this could end up into an entire committee stage of the bill, Mr Speaker. The key issue is to ensure that if, when the filtering process is applied, individuals still feel that inappropriate convictions are remaining on their record, that they get the opportunity to request a review so that there is a second examination to see the appropriateness of those, in, those specific instances being kept on a criminal record and a period of time. I mean, in terms of younger people, there will be, first of all, the fact that the filtering out will be at half the length of time that would apply the case for adults. And secondly, uh, it's a case that there would be an automatic referral where offences had only been committed before the age of 18. So young people wouldn't even have, or those who had committed offences when young, would, wouldn't have to specifically apply. There would be the automatic referral. I do believe that gives us the opportunity to ensure that by the two processes working together that we get things done right. But as I said to Mrs Overend, we will clearly have to keep that under review. Thank you. And uh, Mr Gregory Campbell is not in his place, so I call Mr Roy Beggs. Question number six. <laughs> Mr Speaker, Policing and Community Safety Partnerships evaluate the projects they fund, including those delivered by the community and voluntary sector, as part of an assessment of how the partnerships have met the strategic objectives set for them by the DOJ Policing Board Joint Committee. The recent Sigini inspection review of PCSPs has highlighted the need to have a post-project evaluation against a recognised baseline of agreed measures. While there were some examples of successful projects which represented good value for money, inspectors noted the lack of evidence of value added by others and recommended the development of, basic, of baseline measures against which projects could be assessed. The Department and the Policing Board want to ensure that PCSPs make a positive difference to local policing and community safety issues through effective and efficient interventions and welcome Sir Ginny's recommendations. My officials are working with colleagues in the Policing Board to develop a joint management response with an action plan by mid-February. And Roy begs for a supplementary. Uh, um, the, the clear and interest as, as a, um, um, a member of the CDAG uh, uh, committee in Carrick Fergus, but my, my question is actually, uh, given that there are many uh, of these voluntary groups who do provide value for money uh, and value to the community and community safety issues, how is the minister ensuring that uh, very worthwhile projects will not uh, adversely affect the community by their absence during the transition to the new uh, uh, PCSP arrangements in the new council uh, boundary situation? Well, I appreciate Mr Begg's point because at this stage it is unlikely we'll have PCSPs fully operational with the appointment of independent members before June, whereas obviously the new councils with the elected members on PCSPs will be in place from the 1st of April. So there has been work done between the department and others to ensure that we get uh, joining up and we ensure that work can continue during those three months in which PCSPs will not be fully operational. Um, I've also made arrangements to meet with council chief executives and others involved on the community safety side of the partnerships to look to see exactly how we implement that, how we get the best possible arrangements in place, both for the transition period and to ensure that that transition period does not delay the introduction 
of workable plans for the new, uh, the new partnerships when they become fully operational in the summertime. I call Ms. Karen McEvitt. Mr. Speaker, um, can I ask the Minister, uh, the grants that are available are very important to the community, particularly um, uh, within our elderly population. Um, what percentage or what assessment would we have um, of the grants uh, that is given for the security and protection of our elderly? Well, I, I can't give Ms. McEvitt a, you know, a precise figure for the, um, the proposals for grants as details of budget around that are being worked out. It is, of course, the case the councils will have the ability to put funding into PCSPs as well as the grant which is received from the Joint Committee. So there are a range of opportunities. There are also issues about ensuring uh, building the widest possible partnerships with potentially other providers so that whilst I fully accept the value of the grants, in many cases the value is from the voluntary effort, the joined up partnership working, rather than the money which appears from the centre because there cannot be an expectation, sadly, in the current position that grants will continue at the current level. And I call Mr Alec Maskey. Thank you, Mr. I could ask my colleague to thank the Minister for his answers to the question. Um, could I ask the Minister, has he given any thought to expanding or developing the role of PCSPs in the broader community? Uh, I think the answer to that, Mr Speaker, is it's not entirely for me to develop the role of PCSPs, but members may recall that when the Justice Bill was going through the, the legislature and the Assembly had to consider the concept of PCSPs in the first year of devolution, there was talk about community planning on the horizon for councils, and I made it clear that I saw the PCSPs as being set up in a way which would aid the transition into community planning. It seems to me the real question now is the wider community planning responsibilities and how they will fit around the existing pattern of PCSPs. And I think that will be the challenge for the councils and the other responsible agencies to ensure that that joining up, which has happened at PCSP level, is extended into the wider community planning process. Thank you. And I call Mr. Mickey Brady. Chairs, ever a hard question, Ed. Mr Speaker, I will not be responding to the Schofield report as it was a report commissioned by and submitted to the Policing Board. My department is taking actions to address issues relating to the injury on duty scheme, including reviewing poverty policy and regulations. The department also provided new guidance on reassessments to the Policing Board on the 19th of December. The Policing Board also has steps to take to ensure it meets its statutory responsibilities, including its role as the decision maker in the scheme. And Mickey Brady for a supplementary, please. I thank the Minister for his answer. Is the Minister aware that a number of the recommendations in the Schofield report relate to new regulations or legislation which is required? Given the vast sums of public money involved in the injury and duty award scheme, when will the Minister bring forward proposes to implement these recommendations or reform of the scheme? Well, the Department has already issued guidance on reassessments to the Policing Board uh, in December of last year. Uh, the wider issues looking at the potential for change are issues which are being reviewed in relation to the IOD scheme generally by the Department. But the specific issue at this stage is to ensure that the current arrangements are carried through and the Schofield report made those recommendations to the Policing Board in terms of its responsibilities. And I call Mr Loris Kelly. Uh, perhaps the Minister could outline the, his department's responsibilities in the matter, because my understanding, that's where the real decision and the responsibility for the decision lies. Well, with due respect to Mrs Kelly, it's not my understanding. My, my understanding is the Policing Board has the statutory responsibility for carrying out the reviews, the department has issued guidance, but the responsibility for all issues in the scheme you know, is, is there in terms of uh, all issues relating to decisions. The statutory responsibility is with the policing board, and it is one of those issues which needs to be carried through there with support from the department, but with not the department taking responsibility. And uh, that, ends the period, sorry, that ends the period for listed questions, and we now move on to topical questions. And uh, Mr. Dallet is not in his place, so I call Mr. John McAllister. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That was a lucky one. Uh, they, could I ask them, the Minister, uh, he will be, of course be aware that the Chief Constable is on record as saying with budget cuts uh, the police service may be unrecognisable. Um, 
Would the minister comment on whether he will make sure that the policy of community policing is continued? Well, Mr McAllister's presumption in the first part of his question is quite correct. That is what the Chief Constable said. But it is not up to the minister to ensure that community policing is maintained. It is up to the minister from the department to set the budget for the policing board and the police service. And it is up for the Chief Constable to implement the budget which he has given as he best sees to meet the, uh, the range of needs and the statutory duties which apply to the police service. So uh, whilst clearly uh, many members in this House will be concerned about the issue of community policing in their own constituencies, it has to be the issue for the Chief Constable to assess as to how resources are applied. Supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I'm grateful to the Minister. And indeed, as the Minister alluded in his answer, in my own constituency, there are many um, uh, great examples of where that contact between uh, the police um, and helping to address issues like antisocial behaviour has been absolutely uh, vital. And that's why I'm so determined that that policy, and I, I wish the Minister would get up and give uh, his commitment at least to con the continuation of that and his support to make sure it does be stay as a priority um, for the police. I'm tempted, Mr Speaker, to say thank goodness this is topical and we won't now have five supplementaries praising five separate constituencies. Mr McAllister can make the point, but the Minister of Justice cannot direct the Chief Constable. Now, what Mr McAllister can do as a constituency MLA is meet his local police commanders to talk about how they are responding, how they, how they are meeting the needs, as I'm sure he's not the only person who may have already done it or be contemplating doing that. Um, as a constituency MLA, I have met my two local commanders recently to talk about you know, the way they are managing the local issues. But I probably need to be even more reticent than any other MLA in any suggestion that that might be anything other than MLA and councillors meeting uh, the local commander. But it is one of those difficult issues which flows from the budget which was set and the budget which is given to my department, which even allowing for the additional money given to the police service, still leaves them in a very difficult position at the present time. Thank you, and I call Ms Brenda Hale. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, Minister, I've had several meetings with prison staff from my constituents who work in McGabry Prison, and they've raised serious issues around the staffing levels there, and as a result, prisoner-on-prisoner -prisoner assaults are up. What steps have you taken to improve the safety within the prison? Well, there are certainly concerns which are being addressed on that. One of the key issues which seems to be the determinant of safety within the prison relates to the issue of overcrowding and that's why with the reopening of one of the blocks there's been a reduction in levels of crowding which have seen as providing some benefits but it's almost like the last answer I've just given to Mr McAllister Mr Speaker prison service is managing with a significantly reduced budget both this year and for next year and that means that the work that was done previously around rehabilitation cannot always be done as well or as optimistically as was the situation a couple of years ago. And I call Ms. Hale for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his question. And given that McGabry houses every category of, of prisoner within its walls, what do you, and you have already touched on this with my colleague's answer, but what do you intend to do to ensure the safety of prison officers that it is a priority within McGabry prison itself? Well, indeed, as Mrs Hale quite rightly points out, McGabry is one of the most complex prisons anywhere in these islands, given the number of prisoners that are there. That's why, as a result of the PRT report, there is work being done to ineffectively reconfigure it into three mini-prisons, so that uh, those on remand are kept in different circumstances from those who are sentenced and those who are seen as uh, top security requirements are managed in a different way. That makes it easier to provide the support to the broad range of prisoners who are less likely uh, to create major difficulties, but it also does mean that because McGabry is a single prison coping with such a range of people, it is quite difficult to manage all of that. But I make the key point that by some work which has been done, even against the costs problem that we face at the moment around overcrowding, there has been some reduction in the level of those internal assaults. Thank you, and I call Ms. Rosaline McCarley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers to this point. And can I ask the Minister, does he uh, welcome the fact that uh, 
murder investigations have been reinstated for Bloody Sunday? Well, that again, Mr. Speaker, is an operational issue for the Chief Constable. It was an issue which was being looked at anyway, and as part of the work which he has been reconfiguring around legacy, uh, that particular work has been reinstated. Of course, the key challenge for this House, as indeed potentially for Westminster, will be to look to the formation of the Historical Investigations Unit agreed in the Stormont House Agreement and to ensure that we find the best way possible of dealing with those legacy issues from the past so they don't obstruct good work being done by the police, by the Ombudsman and other agencies for the present day. And Ms McCarley for a supplementary. Um, but would, the, uh, would the Minister not agree with me that, that this will have an immediate impact in terms of raising confidence in policing and justice structures? I suspect certainly amongst those most affected by Bloody Sunday, the, the, the work being done will add to confidence. The problem is, as we've heard at the community policing level in South Down, as we hear about a number of things, confidence in policing has to be an overall package, and that requires difficult prioritisation decisions in difficult circumstances. But certainly, the fact that those who are waiting to see the investigation operating fully, uh, f flowing from the Savile inquiry, will have the opportunity to see that work now being done. But, as I said before, there will be real challenges to ensure that we get the HIU functional as quickly as possible and meeting the needs of those who have concerns about the past. Thank you. And I call Mr Jerry Kelly. Will the Minister reconsider his controversial proposals to, on the reconstitution of the policing board, which will, I believe, limit the independence of independent members and also their effectiveness and also prevent an ability for the board as a corporate body uh, to work together and have those working relationships which uh, have stood bad up till this moment. And could he also explain why he sent the consultation, the selective consultation out on the 19th of December, just before Christmas, and also announced that he was going to put out for appointment at the, at the end of uh, January? Was that the supplementary question as well, Mr Speaker? Um, the answer is, I am consulting at the moment, and I will be consulting the Justice Committee tomorrow afternoon and keen to hear what they say. So it's a bit rich to be asked to reconsider something on which I'm consulting. But some of the points which Mr. Kelly makes, I do not believe accurately represent what is proposed, because I believe the potential for having a rolling reconstitution of the independent members actually provides for better opportunities for continuity, for experience to be uh, built up and kept up at a high level, rather than the situation we faced four years ago when the policing board was reconstituted with only three of the 19 members having any previous service on it. That was not conducive to getting the policing board off onto a good footing four years ago. I think the important issue is to find the best way of maintaining continuity, and certainly the concept of a rolling replacement is something which is fully supported by the Commissioner for Public Appointments, who believes it is preferable to the blanket appointment, which is currently the case. Kelly, for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for the answer up to now. And, uh, it's, it's interesting that he says it's out for consultation and then tells us what his view of it is. Uh, it seems that the Minister has already come to a conclusion about rolling, um, uh, rolling change or rolling appointments and, and of course that is the great difficulty in it because what you will have is independent members and I would ask the member if he is aware or the minister if he is aware that there is a number of councillors who have already rejected uh, this idea but he puts it to the front himself and he will know that this will have an impact on independent members on their independence on the basis that they will be getting reviewed on, on a, a yearly basis. How can they be independent and maintain that, that position? I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Kelly has got it utterly wrong if he's suggesting there's a review on a yearly basis. What I have suggested is my preferred method on which I'm consulting, and it's not entirely unknown that ministers put forward recommendations when they do consultations. I seem to remember OFM, DFM occasionally doing it in the past, but Mr. Kelly was a junior minister. But what I have proposed is that individuals will be appointed for three years with a potential further three years. That's not an annual review which is in a letter which Mr. Kelly and colleagues sent to me recently, that is an appointment for three years. Others will be appointed after a year, but those who have been appointed will be appointed for a three-year process. So it's utter nonsense to suggest that that would have any effect on their independence. And I call Ms. Yeah, Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Can the Minister update the Assembly on recent developments uh, in his department uh, to improve the work and to improve the experience of victims of crime within Northern Ireland? Mr. Speaker, members will know of a number of bits of work, but perhaps it does nothing to, you know, no harm to remind people of some of the work which has been done, much of which flows from work done by the Justice Committee previously when they did their inquiry into the needs of victims and witnesses. I mean, first of all, we formally launched the new victim charter on the 14th of January, a major step forward in defining the services to victims of crime shaped by that work of the Justice Committee and by feedback from vic victims and those who represent them. It's a pretty comprehensive document, so therefore there is an easy read version. There is a young person's version, and I believe it shows the right way in which we should set out those kind of points. There are other issues as well, which have been uh, done recently under the five-year strategy. Um, as well as the Victim Charter, we've seen the establishment of the Victim and Witness Care Unit to provide the single point of contact for uh, as much as possible of the criminal justice process. Uh, we've just seen the second batch of registered intermediaries uh, in place, and so far they've assisted over 300 children and adults with significant communications difficulties. We've formalized the use of victim personal statements. We've extended remote live links. There is a lot of extremely good work, which frequently does not get noticed, but which this assembly, and in particular the former members of the Justice Committee, should take the same pride as I do. Mr. McCarthy, for a supplementary uh, please. Thank, thank the Minister for his very comprehensive um, response. Um, can the Minister confirm that, and he mentions the, the Charter for Victims, will be put on a statutory uh, footing to ensure it becomes a fundamental part of our justice system? Yes, Mr. Speaker, and looking across at the Chair of the Justice Committee, subject to the approval of the Assembly for the Justice Bill as is currently in place. Um, I hope and I see no suggestion that it will not be uh, receiving the support of the committee at least, that the victim charter will be on a statutory footing by the end of this year after royal assent to the Justice Act comes through. So again, that will be a further underpinning of that work with a clear statutory basis and not just a policy document setting out intentions. I'm going Mr. Loris Kelly. Uh, thank you, Principal, Mr. Speaker. Um, Minister, do you share uh, the concerns of many in the community in relation to the on-the-run letter uh, that was given to the alleged killer of Gar Gareth O'Connor? And uh, if so, what, what have you, uh, conversation have you had with the British government in relation to the matter? And have you expressed your disgust at this happening, and particularly in relation to a murder that was post the Good Friday Agreement? Well, um, I suspect Mrs. Kelly knows what David Ford's personal opinion is on this particular issue. As Minister, I have made it clear that the OTR scheme has nothing to do with the Department of Justice, has been nothing to do with the Department of Justice, and will be nothing to do with the Department of Justice. Um, I have made my displeasure with the way the scheme functioned post-devolution. Uh, I've made my displeasure known uh, to Lady Justice Hallett to uh, the uh, Northern Ireland Affairs Committee of the House of Commons and to the Secretary of State on more than one occasion. Uh, I think there are real issues of challenge given, as she put it, the dreadful murder of Gareth O'Connor was significantly after the Good Friday Agreement, and I will certainly be expecting to follow up the issues which flow from that with the Chief Constable when I'm next speaking to him about general issues. Mr. Lawrence Kelly, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, given that your permanent secretary had a role in the NIO office at that time, uh, what confidence do you have in his ability in, in actually informing you of the, the scale and nature of the letters that were delivered by a member of this House, Mr. Jerry Kelly, uh, about whom uh, the coroner has serious concerns and of his role in the matter? Well, it's not for me to answer for Jerry Kelly, but let me repeat, as I've said in this House before. The Permanent Secretary of the Department of Justice did not have a role in the scheme. The individual who is now the Permanent Secretary of the Department of Justice previously worked for the Northern Ireland Office. And just as I do not expect senior officials who worked in the DOJ and transferred to another department to go and tell other ministers from other parties what I'm up to, nor would I expect anybody who transfers into the DOJ to break the confidence they have to the minister that they served 
during the time they were in another department. That is the practical reality of the way civil servants operate. That is how the code of conduct applies, and that is what I would expect, and I believe the behaviour of my permanent secretary was entirely proper. Order. Uh, time is up. Thank you, Minister. And now we